Last week, we talked about the origin story of both Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop roleplay. Born out of miniature wargaming, Dungeons & Dragons revolutionized the hobby's landscape and continues to dominate the gaming industry to this very day. However, the road to Dungeons & Dragons success has, at times, been a path with unexpected twists and turns, harboring its fair share of trolls and booby traps along the way. Indeed, the journey to D&D in the 21st century has been fraught with hardship, betrayal, and even a little panic. Now, a quick warning. In this episode, I'm going to touch on subjects relating to mental health and suicide. If that's not something you want to hear about, I totally understand if you want to click away. Maybe go check out one of my character creation tutorials. But if you're up for learning more about the darker days of Dungeons & Dragons, then welcome to part two of my look into the history of D&D. If you want to know more, roll 2d10. <laughs> In August of 1979, a 16-year-old student attending Michigan State University left his dorm room after writing a suicide note. James Dallas Egbert III had entered the university that year to study computer science. James, as you may be able to tell by his age, was a child prodigy. Supposedly at the age of 12, he had worked with the U.S. Air Force to diagnose and fix a computer issue. Egbert was described as quiet and quirky and a loner who loved science fiction and fantasy. But, according to many reports, he also suffered from depression, drug addiction, and parental pressures. And so, poor James found a quiet, secluded area deep in a series of steam tunnels under the campus and took enough sleeping pills to end his life. Egbert lost consciousness, but awoke some time later confused and quite alive. He fled the tunnels, taking refuge at a friend's house and he threatened to try to kill himself again if this friend told anyone where he was. And so the search for Egbert began in earnest. His parents had hired a private investigator, William Deer. Now, Deer knew extraordinarily little about fantasy role-playing games, but he'd heard some rumors that undergrads played a live-action version of D&D down in the tunnels. And in his general ignorance, William Deer concocted a theory. Deer claimed that James Egbert had been abducted and was most likely being held against his will, and that the young student's life had become indistinguishable from that of his characters. Deer went to the media with this theory, and it was rapidly perpetuated and sensationalized. Meanwhile, Egbert had been moving from place to place, eventually making his way to Louisiana, where he made a second attempt on his life by taking cyanide. Egbert, at the urging of his friends back in Michigan, contacted Detective Deer and revealed his location. He was eventually released into the custody of his uncle later that fall. But, terribly, James Dallas Egbert ultimately took his life in 1980. The facts of Egbert's short life indicate that this brilliant, gifted young man was crushed by expectations of success and the difficulty of his life. The fantasy games he enjoyed seemed to play no role in his death but the media seemed to be more interested in sensational headlines than facts. And in 1984, William Deere published his account of Egbert's disappearance, finally admitting that Dungeons & Dragons had nothing to do with the boy's actions. But the damage was already done. The tragedy of James Egbert's death is just a single example of the moral hysteria that plagued D&D in the early 80s. Books, movies, religious organizations, and advocacy groups like Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons, or BADD, as I mentioned in the other video, fervently used D&D as a scapegoat for everything that was wrong with the culture, citing the game's references to the occult, demons, and monsters as a secret initiation to black magic and devil worship. In my presentation, I show many pictures from the inside of the books just to show the images of this game. I yes. mean, the gruesomeness of this game and the occult link to it. Well, I know that when uh, I did my message, and this has happened, I have letter after letter where people took the pieces. Now, there's sixes involved in the pieces of the game, but they yes. take the pieces of the game, they would throw them in the incinerator or the fireplace, and screams would come out because there seemed to be some kind of spiritual forces inhabiting those pieces. This era of satanic panic helped define the decade. 
But the parental hysteria didn't have the intended effect on D&D that its detractors were hoping for. In a stunning pre-internet example of the Streisand effect, sales of D&D almost quadrupled between 1979 and 1980. Basically, all that bad press and censorship absolutely backfired. By the early 80s, people were more interested in role-playing games and D&D than ever before. And by 1982 alone, sales had risen past 16 million, or about $43 million today if adjusted for inflation. But behind the scenes at company headquarters, everything was not all milk and honey. TSR, the company who produced the game, was going through growing pains. The majority of shares in the company were now owned by the Bloom family, Brian and his brother Kevin, who bought out their father in the late 70s. And the Bloom brothers frequently clashed with TSR CEO, Gary Gygax. Years later, Gygax would comment, I had little control, and in general, what I desired to be done was ignored or the exact opposite was put in place. The company's whirlwind success had a major effect on Gygax's personal life too, leading to a messy divorce in 1983. That year, TSR split into four different companies, with Gygax leaving like Geneva for Hollywood to form TSR Entertainment. In the Golden Hills of California, Gygax shopped the Dungeons & Dragons product around to film studios and TV execs. These endeavors resulted in the popular Dungeons & Dragons cartoon, which ran for three seasons and led to dozens of licensed products. In 1984, TSR released the first in a series of novels called Dragonlance, authored by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, Dragonlance introduced a new campaign setting for advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Not only did this give avid readers something to chew on, but it also made TSR Incorporated the number one publisher of fantasy and sci-fi books in the US. And while TSR Incorporated were doing their thing, Gary Gygax and TSR Entertainment were living that Hollywood lifestyle. He rented a huge mansion and did copious amounts of cocaine. I mean, it was the 80s after all. Gygax spent a lot of time mingling with young starlets and Hollywood elites and negotiating film rights to the popular property. But as the president of TSR Entertainment, he'd been completely removed from the business operations of the rest of the company. But that didn't matter, right? I mean, D&D was massively successful, sales were at an all-time high, and although Gygax was no longer involved in operations, he was still the face of the company, right? Guys? Well, I guess every party's gotta end, right? Around the same time Dragonlance was taking off, Gygax found out that the Bloom Brothers were shopping TSR around New York for a reported $6 million. It turns out, the apparent successful company, with tens of millions of dollars worth of sales, was somehow crippled by massive debt. But how could this be? I mean, TSR was making bank, right? Well, it turns out that with the Blooms at the helm, TSR had expanded into several unprofitable ventures and products, and they hired literally hundreds of employees. And they overprinted books, millions of which sat and sold in warehouses. And they generally operated well beyond the company's means. The TSR board of directors ultimately removed Kevin Bloom as president, and staff was reduced by 75%. These outside directors wanted to have the company sold, but Gygax maneuvered to have himself placed as president and CEO, playing a real-life game of chess with the remaining leadership. In a gamble mimicking TSR's early financial strategy for D&D, Gygax hoped that if he could produce a few more best-selling game supplements, he would be able to convince the other board members not to sell the company. In 1985, two books were released, Unearthed Arcana and Oriental Adventures. Sales and fan reception for Unearthed Arcana were exceptional, so Gygax made his move. To prevent the sale of the company, Gary Gygax exercised his stock options, giving himself 50% control of TSR. He quickly moved to stabilize the company by hiring Lorraine Williams, an experienced financial planner, to manage everything. And like the shrewd businesswoman that she was, Williams cut the dead weight by quickly firing the three outside directors pushing for the company's sale. But unwittingly, Gygax had moved himself into a checkmate. Because remember, I made that chess analogy a few minutes ago? Anyways, the same year, Williams quietly purchased the Bloom Brothers shares of the company. And the Bloom Brothers were all too happy to exercise their stock options, allowing her to purchase the majority control of TSR. 
It was the perfect revenge against Gygax, and then, in a baller move, Lorraine Williams assigned herself as president and CEO, essentially ousting Gygax entirely. And so began the second age of lawsuits. The ensuing court case over the sales of stock favored the new majority owner, Lorraine Williams, queen of business and ruler of the realm. And so Gygax ultimately sold his shares and left the company. And the game he helped found. Under Williams' control, Dungeons and Dragons were made popular and profitable throughout the 80s. To move away from Gygax's Greyhawk as the default D&D setting, TSR began courting Ed Greenwood to develop Forgotten Realms for their upcoming second edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms was a natural choice for TSR because he had a long track record of submitting articles detailing the setting to The Dragon magazine, one of two official magazines for Dungeons and Dragons. The Forgotten Realms campaign set was the first, or second depending on who you ask, of innumerable supplements released. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition finally came out in 1989, and its launch corresponded with an important policy change for the company. To avoid negative attention from media, parents, and advocacy groups, all references to demons and devils were stripped from the game. The good versus evil is white versus black witchcraft, and Anton LaVey, the writer of the Satanist Bible, says there is no such thing as white witchcraft. Well, being a Satan worshiper, he should know. Yeah, and a greater focus on heroics and teamwork was established. The moral ambiguity of the previous edition had been removed, and was now designed to appeal to a younger audience. That year, numerous classic second edition books were released, including The New Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, and those classic maroon handbooks like The Complete Fighter and Complete Thief. Between 1990 and 1995, TSR went on to release seminal settings like Ravenloft, Dark Sun, and Planescape. The company celebrated its 20th anniversary in 1995 with a revised edition of their Advanced Dungeons & Dragons second edition line. However, the gaming industry had evolved throughout the 1990s. Collectible card games, shrinking distribution, and a volatile digital marketplace threatened the future of Dungeons & Dragons and TSR. Could the company that had spent the last 20 years on top of the RPG industry adapt to the world to come? Join me next week as we explore the modern era of Dungeons & Dragons and beyond. Now, obviously, I couldn't touch on every event in the history of D&D. Is there something interesting I didn't include? Leave a comment below and let me know. If you liked this video, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Go fart into a bucket and snip it all. There wasn't any Power Gamer. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Also, Professor Power Gamer doesn't get included in this video because he can go eat butts. He's not a nice guy. He's a jerk. Why would you want to? Why would you want to talk to a guy who reads the book upside down? He eats butts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he eats butts, but Deer claimed that James Egbert, son of a bitch, got shit on my glasses. Hello. Well done, man. Well done.